Welcome to Author Talks. I'm WCBS reporter Peter Haskell. Our guest is Frederick Block. That would be Judge Frederick Block to you. He has written a novel titled Raised to Judgment. Not surprisingly, it's a legal thriller. Judge, thanks for joining us. Why did you decide to write this book? Well, that's a question which may take about two hours to answer, but I'll try to do it in quicker time. Uh, it's a hobby of mine. Uh, there's a creative part to me, and it goes way back, and it's just the part of my left brain, I guess. But I wrote a book about four years ago. It was called uh, Disrobed. I guess I can get a plug in for my old book. Uh, an inside look at the life and work of a federal trial judge. And I wrote that to sort of reach out to the general public to talk a lot about what judges do. It's sort of a memoir. You can find out how you become a federal judge, the type of cases we have in federal court. And what animated me to do that is because people would ask me all these questions. Can you fix my traffic tickets? Do you handle, you know, matrimonial cases, custody cases? And I realized there was an abject lack of understanding by the general public about what we're all about. So I thought that it's important for judges to reach out to the public and share with them uh, our knowledge. And uh, many judges don't do that, but many do now. And we're finding more and more of this happening. The Supreme Court judges are all over the place right now. So that got me started. But the publisher was great. It was Thomson Reuters, but they were not a commercial publishing house. And the book got, you know, very good reviews, but I think people in uh, Kansas and Nebraska probably never heard of it. But in New York City, California did very well. Uh, and then I thought that, you know, I had the idea uh, based upon uh, three or four cases that I had over my career that I can tell a good story. And I got the thought that I can use my experiences, uh, the reality part of my life, and make a good story out of all of that. And then I thought that by doing that, it would be a vehicle also for me to really um, reach out to the public about things that are important that happen in our world. So my characters really speak in terms of a lot of substantive issues. So I think I've written a good book. Nobody has guessed the ending yet. Uh, I'm getting very good reviews on it. I'm very happy that I'm getting a good response. But there's also, I think, a lot of substance in it because we talk about, uh, through my characters, issues about wrongful convictions, which is a big part of the book, Rikers Island, uh, abuse of women uh, in the Hasidic world, uh, and things that are, uh, I feel strongly about, but I don't speak personally about it, uh, but I speak through my characters. So I like to think I wrote an interesting book that's a fun read, and also a book that has some substance to it, and music. So it's interesting, it is a fictional account, Yes, but many of the players either use their real names, Al Sharpton, Ron Kuby, some others, right. and others, if people follow the news, they will be able to identify who the characters are based on. Probably. So, how did that, why did you decide to do it that way, and is there a problem with using the names of people who are still living and involved? Well, uh, I don't know whether it's a problem or not. I haven't been sued yet. I don't think I will be. I try to be balanced. I try to do it in the right way. Uh, the reality part is the reality, and the fictional part is the fictional part. And at the end of the book, in the epilogue, I really uh, explain which was which so that, you know, it would be a fair presentation. And uh, even though there are one or two people who you can uh, say uh, are not looked upon in a good light, I try to balance it by, uh, you know, uh, being fair-minded to these folks at the same time. But yes, it could create some problems. Uh, it's a risk that I thought it was worth taking. So the main character in the book is based on the late Brooklyn DA, Ken Thompson. Why, why that? Why Ken Thompson? Uh, well, you know, uh, he uh, was uh, a former U.S. attorney. And uh, when I uh, became a judge, he was in the office, as they say, in Brooklyn. And uh, his first trial was before me. And then after that, he left the office and he became this uh, advocate for, you know, causes. And uh, he rose to uh, defeat uh, the rainy district attorney in Brooklyn, which is really something that rarely happens. I mean, when you're a DA, you're there for life. So uh, that was extraordinary. So I tracked Ken's career and I was, uh, you know, impressed with what he did. Then what came to a head here in terms of the reality part of my book is that I had the Jabbar Collins case. He was in jail for 16 years on what turned out to be a phony conviction. And it opened up the floodgates for what happened in Brooklyn, which uh, I think is pretty well known now, and certainly the New York community. There have been like 23 
uh, wrongful convictions, and uh, it's still going. There's a special committee that can appoint it before he passed away that's still investigating all of these convictions. And uh, that was based upon one or two of the special prosecutors that uh, the DA had in his office uh, who were just uh, believed that the ends justified the means, and uh, they just uh, did a lot of terrible things that resulted in a lot of innocent people spending, like Jabbar Collins, 16 years in jail. So that gave me the idea for the Jojo Jones character in the book, and that linked Ken Thompson to my character, Ken Williams, which just uh, tracks his career, basically. So wh what was it about Ken Thompson? Was it something about him personally or just the career path that he followed? Well, the career path and the fact that he became so successful and that he was really championing the causes, and he campaigned against the DA on the uh, issue of wrongful convictions, and he basically on the Jabal Collins case. Uh, so I said, wow, that's interesting. Uh, and uh, so that became a real central part, and I thought I'd make him, uh, Ken Williams, the, uh, the, the protagonist in my book. So you have DA, James Neary, who clearly seems based on Joe Hines. You've right. got someone in the DA's office, Anthony Racanelli, who seems to be based on Louis Carcella. Well, it's, uh, it's actually uh, Vecchioni. But Vecchioni, Carcella, okay. Carcella had a lot of problems, but, you know, it's basically a collection of the two. And so is, is there a, a discomfort in not naming names but clearly pointing out who some of these folks are? Well, you know, I just felt I had to do that. There was no real legitimate way of writing this book without doing that. Uh, but I try to be even-handed, and uh, I think that uh, I have not had any negative repercussions so far. And uh, hopefully uh, people will look at this book as one that's constructive, that's fairly presented, and that's a good read and a fun read at the same time. So you are a sitting federal judge in the Eastern District. Do you need to get permission to do this from anybody? No. We have judicial canons of ethics. Uh, and the primary thing that we're sensitive to is not to hold the uh, judiciary in disrepute. I have not done that. I think the judiciary looks pretty good in this book, quite frankly. Uh, and to use good common sense, uh, the uh, uh, Supreme Court judges are all over the place with their books right now. Uh, and uh, so I really feel strongly that judges have a lot of knowledge. They have a lot of information. They can write interesting books. A few judges have done that. I think the one that stands out in my mind is the anatomy of a murder that was made into that major movie picture. And that was done by a sitting Supreme Court judge out in Michigan. And locally, we had the Supreme Court judge up in the Bronx, uh, Torres, who did Carlito's Way. But they're very few. And uh, so I think I'm joining select company. There have been a lot of lawyers, like David Baldacci, who gave me a wonderful review here, who were lawyers and who went on to have illustrious careers as, uh, as authors. I'm curious, though, but if you have a case and Ron Kuby comes before you, right. he's in your book, does that right. pose a potential or an appearance of conflict? I would probably disqualify myself for any case that Ron had, but I spoke to him. I mean, the people who I name in the book, you know, I really chatted with them and I got their permission. Ron loves the book and it puts him in a very favorable light. And when I talk about his background, that's the reality part of the book. I call this reality fiction, but then I fictionalize the story. And uh, he loves it. Uh, so, yes, of course, I use common sense. Uh, I can tell you a funny story about the use of names if I have a moment Please. to do it. Uh, so, uh, one of my dear colleagues, Judge Spat, who's out in Central Islip, uh, I think Arthur's 91 years of age now, and he's a fan of mine. He loved my last book. So, I have he's him. He's the one guy who calls you a kid. <laughs> yeah. So I have him do a cameo appearance. He's an arraignment judge in the book. And I fictionalized him. I called him Archibald Spat. And out of respect for him, I sent him what I wrote about him. And I wrote about him in a positive way in the book. And uh, so um, I just thought it was the courteous thing to do. So his secretary called me up the day, so the day after. He said, Judge Block, uh, Judge Spatton really appreciates the fact that you sent him this. And uh, that, that, but he just wants you to know that his real name is Arthur Spatton, not Archibald oh, Spatton. I was trying to fictionalize it. He wanted his real name in the book. So there's a lot of fun things that happen when you, uh, when you run the risk of, you know, doing things like this. So one of the other interesting things in the book, you have music interspersed through it. I'm going to ask you to set up your phone. You lost your home screen. We got it. And you have the lyrics of the songs, and people can actually see the sheet music, and they can hear the songs. Why don't you 
tell us a little bit about it and play it. So, a hobby of mine is music, and I had an off-Broadway show called Professionally Speaking that I played in the mid-'80s, and it was got fairly good reviews, but it did have a lot of you know commercial legs to it. Uh, so it's always been part of my life. And then I had a, a, a period of time when I wrote a lot of country music songs, and I uh, just knew somebody who was in the business, and I was just doing The it Brooklyn to, Cowboy. Well, I just was curious whether a Jewish Brooklyn judge could write country music. Uh, and uh, so I did that, and I stockpiled these songs. And then when I wrote the book, I said, how do I compete with John Grisham and David Baldacci and all these you know, name brands? And uh, I think I wrote a good book, and I think it competes with them on that level. But uh, they can't write music. So I said, what the heck? Let me put my music in the book. I'll have a place for it. And I made my protagonist a musician. And when you write, of course, you write a little bit about yourself. You're in the book. So I think, wow, I can use my music now. So that's really what animated me to do it. Well, let's just listen to a little bit. So here's the first one uh, in the book that uh, is being sung by Ken Thompson at Arturo's Cafe, not too far from here. Uh, it was animated by the fact that uh, his uh, private eye, Mug, uh, Mickey Zizou, uh, who's my sort of black Joe Pesci type, he's my comedic relief in the book and also an important investigator. So he would, you know, tell, you know, Ken, come on, boss, get off of my case. You know, there ain't no fun I ever had when I was good instead of bad. And uh, so that gave him the hook. And then he writes the song and then he sings it. When I was hitched to Laura Lee, I thought I'd be living happily. She was young and sexy and pretty as can be. But little did I know she was cheating on me. You go and tell by the way, you can use Brooklyn Cowboy, the Brooklyn Cowboy. <laughs> so you're you're a working general, federal judge. Yes, I am. You're an author songwriter, do you have any hobbies? <laughs> it, it seems like a how do you Actually, fit, I do. <laughs> how do you fit this into the course of a week, all these things? You know, Pete, I'm asked that question a lot, and I just think the good Lord has just blessed me with the opportunity to do this. And uh, I just, you know, knock on wood that I can stay vital. And, uh, you know, you have no control over, you know, a lot of your life. Uh, and I can just do this. Don't ask me why. Uh, and uh, I think it's just a God-given talent. Where do you derive the most satisfaction? Well, I certainly enjoy being interviewed here. Uh, I'm anxious in reaching out to the public and hopefully getting my book well received. But I think that, uh, I, you know, people ask me, uh, you know, the secret to life, when you get to be old, you get that question a lot. I think to live a creative life uh, and to live a life where you're willing to run risks. And a long time ago, a client of mine, you know, gave me some advice which stuck in my head that if you're willing to risk rejection, you're going to have a successful life. And a lot of people are fearful, they hold back, and uh, I try not to do that. And I'm willing to run the risk of, you know, people saying bad things about me. Certainly the press has said some negative things from time to time about things I've said. Uh, but uh, I think that it adds to the quality of your life, to be open-minded, not to be fearful, and to uh, uh, the Greeks, I'm married to a wonderful Greek woman, uh, their concept of tragedy is not to realize your potential in life. So I think of those things in terms of what really motivates me to live. And you have to be lucky with health, of course, and that you don't become Alzheimer's and you, know, you read all these tragedies. Uh, I think that one of the things I smile at when I write these books is that it's sort of a way for me to tell me whether it's time to leave the bench. Uh, because we're there for life, and I think you have to be responsible to know that there may come a time when you really should not be doing the job anymore. So I think by writing the book, I don't think I have dementia yet, so I'm happy to be able to continue next year with me in a federal court judge, and hopefully some years after that, but it's an issue that we are concerned about. So I'm saying about a lot of things here, I'm putting them all together in one pot, uh, but I hope it gives you a sense of you know, who I am and why I do what I do. So you're 83 years old. How much thought do you give about how much longer am I going to do this? Who knows? But um, I'm sorry. Do you think about it? Yeah, I do. So I left the book hanging, and uh, I'm not going to tell anybody about the ending. Nobody has guessed it yet. But I did it on purpose because I'm writing the sequel. 
and uh, hopefully, you know, I'll be able to you know, live long enough and be mentally alert to finish it off. And it's going to be another reality fiction book. It's called Tentatively Radical Justice, and we have terrorist cases in the court. I've got a few of them. And I think the public really maybe wants to know a little bit about that. So that's the reality part of my new book, and it's going to be about terrorism in the courtroom. So Ken Williams will still be on the job. He's still there. He's the DA. Uh, and, uh, but I have now a new protagonist, lawyer protagonist, I call Ben Bradford. It's going to be taken after Ben Brofman, who's, uh, you know, had uh, one of his great cases before me years ago. And uh, he's a friend and a supporter. So I'm using him as Ben Bradford. I told him about it already. You enjoy being a judge? I feel really privileged. Uh, and, you know, one of the difficult things about what we're doing today is that it's important for me to have everyone realize that I really am a judge. And I take the position seriously, and I think that we have a real responsibility to do the right job. I've had a lot of high-profile cases. I had the Peter Gotti case. I had the Bear Stearns case. It's important also for the public not to associate you with the case because, you know, when you're uh, a judge, it should be all about the case. It should not be about you. When you're writing a book, it should be all about you. So you sort of flip your mind a little bit. Uh, but uh, I take my uh, judicial responsibilities very seriously. So it's a serious job, and I suspect yeah. in a lot of ways it's a stressful job. What, is the, what does the writing do for you? Well, it's a bit of a catharsis. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, people ask me, you know, where do you have the time to write this? And, uh, but, you know, I read that, you know, people spend about 11 hours with this machine a day. They spend four hours on television. I watch the news at night, and I, I like to watch, you know, Indiana lose their basketball games. I went to IU years ago. Uh, and, uh, but I don't watch television. I don't really know what's on. Uh, and uh, instead of that, I'm motivated to write music. I'm motivated to write my next book. And I do find the time to do it. When you're turned on, it's amazing how, you know, the old adage, if you have something to do, give it to a busy person. Uh, and then I like to joke around by saying that uh, when you're my age, you just uh, write faster. And so how long does it take to do this? What, from beginning to end with a book? So people ask that question all the time. I'm sure that you've interviewed other authors, that's a common question. So when, to me, the starting point is when the idea gets into your head uh, and it germinates. And, you know, I, this happened a couple of years ago when I started to realize that I had these cool, you know, cases that I had that could really, really uh, be the basis for a story. Uh, and then I really wrote it in my head. Uh, and everybody uses different techniques. I talk to authors all over the place, and they have different ways of going about what they do. They're all valid, but for me, just think about it. A lot of the ideas I get are 3 in the morning. Most of my musical ideas come at 3 in the morning. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's, uh, I just get a kick out of that. Uh, but uh, the uh, essence of it is that I find I have the time to do it. And when I started to write it, and I just took from my head what I had in my head. It took me about six months to get it down in this format. So to become a judge, you have to become a lawyer. You have to go to law school, become a lawyer. To become an author, do, did you need, did you feel you needed any kind of training? Did you have any? You just had ideas and you put them down. Maybe it was presumptuous. I had no idea I could do this. I knew I could write legal opinions. I've been doing that. I knew I could write this role because that was, you know, pretty autobiographical, uh, like a memoir. But uh, I didn't know whether I could do this at all. But I'll tell you what really motivated it. Two things. First of all, a colleague of mine from Massachusetts called me who read my prior book, Michael Ponser, very fine district court judge from Massachusetts. And he had written a novel called The Hanging Judge, which did well. And then he's written recently the sequel called The One-Eyed Judge. And uh, so he said, why don't you try fiction? Because, you know, you can write. And I said, Michael, I don't know that I can do this. And I'm going to be 80 years old. Give me a break. Uh, but uh, I was encouraged by him to do it. So I sat down. I started to write the beginning of it. I said, you know, I think I can do this. I never had any uh, schooling. I never really, it was presumptuous of me to do this. But, uh, wow, I mean, I looked at that. And I, people say this was not written by an amateur. I just was able to do it. Don't ask me why. I, just was able to do it. Judge Frederick Clark, fascinating. Uh, a quick read. Thank you so much for coming in. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Judge Block is sitting federal judge in the Eastern District. He has written a race to judgment. I'm Peter Haskell. Thanks for joining us.